as I was thinking about tonight's program, um, it also occurred to me that our organization was founded in the same year that the Choctaw became the first nation to be removed by the US government from their homelands in Alabama and Mississippi as a result of the Indian Removal Act, which began uh, what is popularly known as the Trail of Tears. And at that time, I was thinking about what the founders of this historical and philosophical society, as it was then known, um, might have been thinking. And it's most likely that they gave absolutely no consideration to collecting or sharing stories and objects related to Virginia's Indian tribes. But I'm pleased to say that we're not your great, great, great grandparents' historical society, and today we are absolutely dedicated to sharing diverse and inclusive stories that represent all Virginians. In fact, the seeds of tonight's program were planted a year ago when the museum hosted a half-day symposium focusing on the life, legend, and legacy of Pocahontas. And it was during that program that Chief of the Chickahominy Indian tribe Steve Adkins remarked that he was encouraged that our institution was willing to offer a forum for Native people to tell their own stories. And so tonight we're again honored to be able to provide such a forum and to kick off four days of storytelling by and about Native Americans as part of the Pocahontas Reframed Storytellers Film Festival. And really, it's remarkable that in just a few years, Executive Director Brad Brown and his colleagues have made Richmond the home to perhaps the largest Native American film festival on the East Coast. And I'm really grateful for Brad's cooperation and enthusiasm in working with the museum to bring together tonight's program. And I really look forward to continuing that excellent partnership and relationship. So thank you, Brad, wherever you took a seat. Tonight's program uh, would also not be possible without the generous support of the 2019 commemoration uh, American Evolution, who for nearly a year uh, and even more in the planning, have been telling the stories of events of national significance that occurred in Virginia 400 years ago. The 2019 commemoration not only supported tonight's program, but our exhibition determined the 400-year struggle for black equality, which is on display upstairs, is a legacy project of the 2019 commemoration. And I'd really like to thank Amy Ritchie, who's here in the front row, who's the Associate Director for Partnership Programs, whose encouragement and guidance and input was so very helpful as we organized tonight's program. So thank you, Amy. And I'm very pleased to be able to introduce to you all Kathy Spangler, Executive Director of the 2019 Commemoration who's been an enthusiastic supporter of this program and of the museum, and I'm sure would love to tell you more about American Evolution and what they've been doing and what they're about to do. Good evening. It's great to see you all here, and, and thank you, and Andy, for the warm introduction and, and for the importance of this event. Um, we are, the 2019 Commemoration American Evolution is proud to be a founding sponsor of the Pocahontas Reframed Storytellers Film Festival and this special event, From Real to Real Indians. I'd like to thank the Virginia Museum of History and Culture for your strategic partnership. Um, it has been such a blessing to the commemoration and our efforts to amplify the history of 1619 in contemporary ways so that all of us can come to touch and, and learn and know about the importance of this history. You know, the accurate telling of American history is embedded in the events and initiatives of the 2019 commemoration, American Evolution. This marks the 400th anniversary of key historic events that occurred in Virginia uh, during 1619 that continue to influence America today, from the first representative legislative assembly in the New World the arrival of the first enslaved Africans to English North America, 
the recruitment of English women in significant numbers, uh, and the first official English Thanksgiving. Our themes of democracy, diversity, and opportunity have inspired conversations, uh, and we have been blessed with programs of national and international significance. In 1619, Virginia, three cultures collided, Virginia Indian, English, and African. The intersections between these cultures forged what would eventually become the United States and demonstrates the diversity that has always been part of this American evolution and our story. Virginia Indian culture is rich and a vibrant part of Virginia 400 years later. And so we're so excited that you're here to learn more about that, um, not only the history, but the contemporary values and impact that our Virginia Indians have today. I do look forward to hearing from our panelists, uh, certainly uh, the movie itself, uh, but I know, I've come to know um, many of the panelists, they've been very involved in the commemoration, uh, and there is such um, important messages that they have to share. So I'm just grateful for all of you to be here, um, and we really hope that you enjoy the film and the discussion um, of Neil Diamond's Real Engine. If you haven't, Brad, I'm here for you, if you haven't purchased passes for the Pocahontas Reframed Storytellers Film, film Festival, it's not too late. It's gonna be at the Bird Theater over the next four days, uh, and they will continue to be on sale at the box office. Uh, we have brochures of all of the films that will be shown at the film festival this weekend on tables outside uh, the theater, and we really would encourage you and invite you to be part of what we know and believe will be a very significant film festival that will grow continually in years to come. It's certainly been our pleasure to partner with all of you and we look forward to the evening. I'll not keep it from you any longer. Thank you very much. So tonight's film, uh, Real Engine, focuses on Hollywood's portrayals of Native people and the effect uh, that a century of films have had in shaping a stereotypical image of Indians among non-Native people, and also has challenged the self-identity of many Native people. And this question of identity is important to members of Virginia's Indian tribes who as I've come to learn from talking with our panelists tonight, are experiences that are very different from other groups in other regions uh, in what became the United States and in America. So tonight's discussion will explore how, as groups and individuals, Virginia Indians have been able to maintain their identity and culture into the 21st century, despite efforts and forces that have threatened over time to eradicate it. So it's my honor to introduce Chief Lynette Alston here at, at, my, at my left. <laughs> of the Nottoway Indian Tribe of Virginia who will moderate tonight's discussion. Afterward, uh, the panel will take your questions before we screen the film. So, Chief Alston is the Chief and Tribal Council Chair of the Nottoway Indian Tribe of Virginia, one of 11, 11 tribes officially recognized by the Commonwealth. The primary focus of the Nottoway Indian Tribe of Virginia has been to offer educational outreach and opportunities to close gaps that exist in understanding the history and culture of the Nottoway Indians. Chief Alston resides in the place where she spent her formative years through high school on the family farm in Druryville, Virginia. A graduate of Duke University with a degree in history, she returned to Virginia after retiring from two decades in, of business ownership in South Carolina. In 2018, she was one of the 50 for 50 Inspiration Award recipients from the Virginia Commission for the Arts. And uh, I was reminded that uh, 
Every day in this museum, Chief Alston is featured in a film called Virginia Voices, which is about Virginia's people and uh, is played here daily. So I'll not keep you in suspense any longer and turn the stage over to Chief Alston. Thank you so much, Andy. And I'm going to introduce our illustrious panel. <laughs> I'm going to begin with a remarkable woman, <laughs> Chief Ann Richardson. She's the chief. <laughs> She's the chief of the Rappahannock tribe, and she's the first woman chief of the tribe since 1705. Uh, she is also the fourth generation chief in her family. So, Chief Anne. Thank you. Wayne Atkins is a citizen of the Chickahominy tribe. He's been a member of the Chickahominy Tribal Council since 1996 and has served as the first assistant chief since June of 2011 after serving as second assistant chief for 10 years. Wayne served as the Chickahominy Tribe's member of the Virginia Indian Tribal Alliance for Life since its inception in 2001 and served many years as its president this organization was instrumental in gaining federal government recognition of six Virginia tribes through congressional legislation. He serves on the board of Henricus Historical Park in Chesterfield County and on the board of Virginia Humanities, the State Humanities Council for the Commonwealth of Virginia. A graduate of Charles City High School, Wayne obtained his Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from the University of Virginia in 1976. He is retired from a career in electrical engineering and currently is the finance officer for the Chickahominy Tribe. First Assistant Chief Wayne Atkins. <laughs> Dr. Ashley Spivey is a historical and economic anthropologist with training in archaeology. She's a member of the Pamunkey Indian Tribe and formerly acted as director of the Pamunkey Indian Museum and Cultural Center and the Pamunkey Indian Tribal Resource Center. She's worked with tribes as well as university and museum institutions to address needs through the development of cultural resource management and tribal historic preservation. She does this through compliance programs addressing federal processes, including the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Dr. Spivey specializes in indigenous community ethnographic and historical research, tribal museum management, project development and data management, grant writing and management, <laughs> and tribal administrative capacity building and being a mother. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's begin this discussion. Stereotypes of Native people have been depicted in film since the 1920s. And Virginia's indigenous people have not been immune to the demeaning depictions and the impact on our identity. How have stereotypes impacted Virginia's Native people, and how do Virginia Indians perceive themselves? <laughs> Who would like to begin? <laughs> I'll kick, up, kick that one off. Um, a little bit about the stereotypes and how they affect, uh, I guess, affected um, our generations in, the say, the mid-50s. Uh, we would see uh, pictures of Indians on TV. We knew we were Native people, we were Indians, but somehow the way they were depicted on TV was different from what we knew to be the real thing. And so I think it created confusion in our minds sometimes, um, maybe even questioning uh, our own authenticity sometimes because we knew that was not the way we lived. And part of that was um, even though the depictions may have been close to being accurate, uh, Native people all over the country are different. No one tribe is like another. And so you see a lot of diversity 
across the country, and most of the natives that we saw on TV were Western, um, from the Western tribes, and so their culture was quite a bit different than what we were accustomed to and what we knew to be our truth, and so I think sometimes it created uh, some confusion in younger people as they tried to reason out how uh, people could be depicted on TV as Indian, but that reality was a lot different from what they knew. I will um, weigh in on that. I think um, the stereotypes that people were seeing in film were uh, primarily um, degrading to Native people. They were seen as uh, wild. They were seen as drunks. They were seen uh, as dumb, not being able to understand. And those stereotypes um, became embedded in the minds of the public and it made it difficult for us to work with people as marginalized communities anyway here in Virginia. Um, I can remember going to several state offices years ago and having them look at me like, you know, the Indians are coming, the Indians are coming, and, you know, what do they want? And, um, and when you speak to them and you're intelligent, they look at you like, they're surprised about it. Uh, they expect you to be dumb and not be able to understand. And, um, and then when you're not doing that, they're like shocked about it. So those are the things that I can remember at 63 years old dealing with um, tribal government issues here in the state of Virginia. And I'll weigh in as well. Um, you know, Wayne uh, it will end, and Chief Ann also pointed out that these are outside perceptions about how Indians should look. Um, some of it's based in reality in terms of tribal people from west of the Mississippi. Um, it's still problematic, even for those folks, definitely. But it contributed to this con conception that Indian people in the United States have, are supposed to be looking a certain way. Um, they're supposed to live in teepees. They're supposed to wear double braids. They're supposed to have, you know, have feathers in their hair, um, which is fine for some communities, and particularly when it comes to dressing in that way for important events, um, for ceremonial events, for religious purposes. But when it comes to how we were perceiving ourselves, and especially in the 20th century, that's not how we saw ourselves. But unfortunately, that's how the outside world saw Indians. And that's how the outside world expected us to be, to act, to look like. So we've been dealing with these negative stereotypes even in the 21st century. Um, I get asked quite frankly, frequently, seriously, if I live in a teepee. Um, I'm not joking. <laughs> um, it contributed to this concept that Native people do not live in the modern er era, that we are not modern people, just like the rest of everybody else living in the 21st century, 20th century, et cetera. Um, and that, again, Wayne hit on it, if we aren't living that life that is seen in the stereotypes, then we're not authentic. We're not real. We're not considered real Indians because we don't look, act, and think a certain way that is expected from outside perceptions. Um, I will say that one, historically, one strategic way, I think that our people did utilize those stereotypes, um, I think, to share with the outside world that we were Native people was during the early 20th century when we were facing Jim Crow segregation as people of color and we were facing the eugenics movement. Um, in particular, and I know we'll get more into this into the program, but in particular uh, laws that were stating that we were colored and we were not Indian. So in many ways, tribes used a pan-Indian identity publicly to express to this outside world that was denying us our identity that we were Indians. And that comes with a lot of fraught, I think, you know, confusion, as Wayne said, and, and fraught feelings about having to do that outwardly when we know inside that it's not 100% of who we were. So it has, it's, it has a negative perception for us and, and a negative um, consequences for how we view ourselves. Yeah. Well, those laws of Virginia have been in place meant since the 1600s. Mm -hmm. And they have affected the lives of Virginia tribes. Um, can you speak to some of the circumstances and the laws 
through time, because 1705, we find the first of the, the, the laws that affect Native folk. Um, so speak a little bit about how those laws have impacted our Native culture. Well, I'll start off that. Um, I think that, you know, during this time, Native people could not go to court and they couldn't testify on behalf of themselves or their people. Their word was not taken in court. These were all pieces of a long-term systemic campaign to marginalize the tribes and to um, somehow illegitimize the tribes. Um, and so that started very early on. And most of the laws, I believe, were put into place. Um, the idea was to keep the English in control and in power. And so laws would be passed to tuck away rights and um, opportunities for non-English people. And so that certainly impacted the, the early lives of Virginia uh, natives as soon as the English came. And so it started very early on and continued well into the 20th century. Uh, different laws would be passed so that the English would remain in control, and that control could be political control, it could be financial or economic control. Mm -hmm. So through education or lack of it, through lack of uh, jobs to be able to make money, to be able to pay your way, um, all of those were, were done in a way to marginalize the, the native people and to keep the English in control. Um, Andy mentioned the, the date 1831. Um, as I guess one of the first dates that pointing to the removal <coughs> of tribes from the southeast to Oklahoma, uh, which w at that time was Indian territory. So I can tell you what's going on in Virginia at 18, in 1831. Um, there are laws that are in place, as, as Chief Ann and, and Wayne had mentioned, that are there to marginalize our people and to also, again, eradicate our identity. Um, there's certain laws in place that define what is Indian and what is not Indian. And if you do not meet those definitions, then you're, you're not considered Indian. And, and a lot of that was inclu included in our marriage. Um, again, that was not something that we practiced. Uh, traditionally, our people practiced uh, intermarrying with folks, and those people became a part of your community. Um, you know, and your children were a part of that community. You weren't determined by this concept of quote unquote blood quantum, that you know your child is less than because their father or their mother is not a member of that community. That has had extremely detrimental effects on Indian people in Virginia and across the country. Um, in 1831, the Virginia legislators, Virginia leaders, are actually in the process of enacting some of these laws looking at these native communities who are residing on, on reservations at the time and saying that you're not real Indians because you've intermarried too much with, with the African-American community or, or non-native non -native community writ large. So we are going to terminate your tribal status um, with the state of Virginia and we are gonna remove you, we're gonna lot your reservations so that eventually we can take them over and you will be basically legislated out of existence. That didn't just start with Walter Plecker in 1924, which I know we'll get more into that. It started a, cent a century and even earlier than that. And there was, a lot of folks don't understand that there was a reservation system in the state of Virginia. There's only two reservations left mm -hmm. in the state of Virginia, and that was not due to efforts to remove all native people in terms of their tribal status and remove them from their lands in the state of Virginia. So while it was happening on a national level, it was also happening on the state level as well. Right. 1831 is the year that the Nottaway began to take allotments of reservation land to become individual landowners. But after that, they had to have a white person sign a paper that they would take to court to say that they are native and not mixed. So um, 1831 was a tremendous year in native culture. We're what? talking, too, about the, the Trail of Tears, and we think of that as the removal of 
Indians from the East Coast to Oklahoma and other places, but those things were happening in, in Virginia long before there was even a United States, and so many people don't know that history, as Dr. Spivey said. The reservation system actually started here before there was a United States, and tribes were removed. We don't know that it was considered a trail of tears, but Chickahominy in particular, we were located on the Chickahominy River, and that's the river takes its name from us, but in 1648, we were relocated from that area. There was a treaty that was signed that established a certain area that was for Indian people, a certain area for English people, and the two were supposed to be separated. And so we were relocated along with other tribes into an uh, area of Virginia that's now King and Queen, King William County, in that particular area. And before the treaty was even completed, the English were starting to encroach on that land. So it's a very familiar history that you hear about for Western tribes, but that same activity was going on here in Virginia long before there was even a United States. So it seems like a lot of the English policy that was started here became the United States policy of removing Indians from land that the English wanted, putting the Indians on land that the English didn't want because the Chickahominy were located to an area where we eventually said the land was so poor we couldn't even go tr grow trees for firewood. Mm -hmm. And so that's a very typical story of what's happened to many tribes in Virginia, uh, in the United States, but it actually started here long before there was a United States. Yeah, Wayne, I would like to weigh in on that mm -hmm. in doing the research, even on the Nottaway people, uh, the Nansman people also, there were um, these supposed to be trustees. Um, these were uh, white men who became managers, if you will, of the natural resources and the Indians on the reservation. And um, the reservation would have to uh, make enough money every year from its leases or whatever to pay its taxes and take care of the people. And if it wasn't doing that, then they would declare that the land um, couldn't sustain the people, mm -hmm. and then they would turn it over or in the allotment process like mm -hmm. they did with you guys, and then where these trustees who were supposed to be people managing this really would end up with the, with the land. So it was a, a systematic uh, strategy to remove the Indians from their land uh, and move it over into white hands. Mm -hmm. So. And oh, I was going to say, we're still here. Yeah. That's yeah. been the <laughs> mantra for Virginia's first people, okay? So what are some of the tactics for survival? What, what helped us stay here? So I was going to jump in with, with something that was related to that. Um, even though our people experienced an immense loss of, of our ancestral lands over the last 400 years, I think one of the things that our people can look to is our relationship to, to the water, especially um, given that we are you know, tidewater people, uh, people of the water, um, and that even though maybe we didn't own some of that land, the folks who had their reservations allotted and could no longer call, them, call that their reservation, we were in close proximity to the resources that we had been utilizing for generations upon generations upon generations. And that includes the land, that includes the water, fish, um, the, the, the animals that lived in the wetlands, the plants that were in the wetlands. These were the things that sustained us. Um, I know for my community, specifically the Pamunkey, without having that immediate access to the marshland and to the river, I don't think we would have been able to survive. So for us, in many ways, that cultural survival is in the way that we traditionally utilized our waters and our lands, our traditional subsistence, as you will, um, and our relationship to that. And you know, today, I know we'll get more into future generations, um, but today that's, that's a big fear for a lot of tribal members is losing the knowledge affiliated with those practices um, because in many ways that's a loss of our connection to that place, to the place and to the waters that have sustained us. So that's one thing that I would point to, is still being able to practice those things, even though we might not have had quote unquote ownership of the land. You know, the arts 
and oral history and storytelling and traditional crafts, they played a major role in Native America being able to retain identity. And uh, what are some of the challenges that we are facing now with future generations in retaining these traditions? iPhones, iPads, <laughs> YouTube. <laughs> yeah, for me, to, to follow up with that and to sum it up, uh, most of our children attend public schools, and so they have the same diversions, if you will, that uh, other kids have. So they have soccer and cheerleading and chess clubs and whatever else there may be. So it really is a competition for time to be able to allow them to be kids and to be part of their modern world and to do what their peers do, but also to have that time to pass on the cultural aspects. And it's very difficult to do. It used to be done family by family, but families are so busy now that sometimes we have to make special efforts uh, to the point of setting up classes or something that kids can come and learn pottery, beadwork, history even, because uh, the history is not really being passed down as it used to be. It's being passed down, but not in the necessarily family to family. So th to me, the, one of the biggest challenges is just the time, having the time, even the parents having the time to do it because the parents are so busy and in today's world, if you're gonna live even a moderate life, both parents have to work. And so it's, it's, time is really a premium to be able to pass on the cultural aspects of, and the historical aspects of the tribe. Well, we're, you know, um, we're still viewed as being artifacts. <laughs> and um, what are some of the things we can do to help people understand we're not going to walk around in regalia. Uh, we do drive cars. Uh, we live in houses. We're contemporary Native people. So what are some of the things we can do that can help people understand that we work, live, just like everybody else? I think that um, a lot of that comes with just educating people. And of course, if you're born in a tribal community, you automatically become a historian because everybody you meet wants to know about your tribe and you have the opportunity to tell these stories to people. Um, and here in Virginia, it's been a, a, a difficult thing to do because uh, so much of our history was covered over. Um, and really, there was no avenue for Native people to really publicly talk about their history. Um, and with the lack of economic resources that the tribes have experienced, they didn't have the opportunity or the finances to produce documentaries and films and write books that needed to be done. And so we had to rely upon historians to kind of get the word out um, about us. And I, I think now that tribes are have more resources, I was thinking about um, the stereotypes that you were talking about earlier. Uh, when Dr. Um, Spivey was talking about how that has impacted our identity. I remember visiting um, one of the reservations in New Mexico um, several times and having the people out there call me rich Indian. And of course, when you visit some of these places, you understand you know, that someone that works and lives in a house um, really can be considered rich by people who live in adobe homes still um, and walk however many miles to get to a chapter house so that they can get water in their house. Um, so those are the conditions in another part of the country which is not reflective of what we have here. And that's how different tribes can be. Um, but here, when you say you're Native American, everybody thinks it's the same. And that kind of clumps us in something that we're not. Uh, even if we're even recognized as Native American, nobody really truly understands the diversity that is present within the tribes just in Virginia. Um, so, you know, 
today in trying to keep tradition going among uh, young people is a very pivotal part of the survival of our people. And I say we've been in survival mode for 400 plus years. Um, I had a conversation with my granddaughter a few years ago when we were arguing about where she was going to college. And um, I was telling her about my experience as a young person. And she goes, she calls me Nina. She goes, Nina, you live your whole life just in case. And it was a little shocking to me. I had to really think about what she had said. And then I realized that in our culture, we are taught because of all of the opposition in the outside world to prepare for everything just in case. And that's a tribal tradition. Uh, and so she didn't grow up in our community. She grew up in Texas. And so now that she's back here, I'm teaching her about the just in case and why that's so important. And she's learning that as an adult. Now she'll come back to me and say, oh, just in case, Nina, uh, you know, and I'm really glad about that. So, you know, there are subtle differences in the way that tribal people think from other people. And looking at us today in business suits, we're no different than everybody else people think, but we're very different underneath. Telling our own story is, is important, and that's why it's so wonderful being here, to be able to talk about all of who we are and how we are part of, we are America, okay? Um, but what are your thoughts about uh, going forward? What's, what's ahead for Virginia tribes? What, what's going to happen with our next generation? Well, as the, a person who has the next generation the next literally generation. on the way, <laughs> I and my, my, my five-year-old, well, he was in the audience. He probably had to go to the bathroom. Um, I think about this a lot. Um, I, I live on, on the reservation. Um, I haven't lived there my whole life, but I've always, that place has always been a part of my life. That's where my mom, you know, grew up, her, her parents grew up, her sisters, and it's always been a part of, of who I am. Um, and I've been able to learn what it means to be a Pamunkey Indian person, you know, through my family and because of that connection to that place. And I've had to recognize as I got older that I, not all tribal members were as lucky as me to be able to have this connection to this, to this small place in rural Virginia and King William County because so many folks have had to move away for various circumstances, economic, you know, opportunity being one of the main ones. And so one of my hopes for the future is that with our new status as a federally recognized tribe, we will have the opportunity to actually develop economic self-sufficiency and economic programs close to our, our community. Um, even if we have to go to Richmond, it's still not only an hour away so that Folks don't have to move so far away to be able to make a living. Um, because I really feel like having that relationship to, the, to that place, the reservation, is what's going to be able to sustain us in the future. Um, and unfortunately, you know, we, as Wayne mentioned, learning about who you are and about where you belong is many ways learned at the kitchen table. It's, it's learned with your family. And with all of these issues that we're facing in the modern world at a fa faster pace, um, with all of the distractions, it's harder to learn about who we are at the kitchen table anymore. So I feel like we're gonna have to also make a concerted effort as tribal members, as a community, to institutionalize in many ways um, for our young people, for our youth, ways to learn about our history and about our culture um, because it's not gonna be here always if we don't make that effort. So that's my, my personal hope for the future. And I could echo the same thing, particularly for the Chickahominy tribe. We, we now have um, access to, to some resources sources that we didn't have before. Cultural um, revitalization and preservation is high on our list. It always has been, but we've never really had the time or the resources to do it. And so now we're making a 
concerted effort to put programs into place so we can actually uh, teach kids what's, um, what their history is. But probably even more important than that, we've always wanted our kids to be involved in what, what's happening with the tribe. But at Chickahominy, we're making a concerted effort to include the children in what's going on, to get them exposed to the tribal government and how it functions, to let them know what it takes to make um, a tribe run. You know, if you're on the outside looking in, it looks like it just runs itself, but it takes people who are dedicated, willing to learn, willing to work. And not get paid. Sorry. True. <laughs> Gotta throw that in there. <laughs> There's a lot of that too. A lot of, um, I always say that as tribal leaders, we are volunteers. We're not really volunteers. We're unpaid elected officials, so, um, it's, which is quite a bit different from being just a plain volunteer, but it's something that all of us do willingly. We wouldn't do it any other way. Um, I've all, often said I, I continue to do everything I do for, for nothing just because it's for the good of the children, uh, good of, of the future generations. I have a granddaughter who's four years old, and so I'm starting to <coughs> talk to her a little bit. Um, I still don't think she understands the concept of being a native person or what it means to be Chickahominy, but I think it's never too early to start talking about that. But as a tribe, we want to do it more than just a one-on-one. -on -one. We want to be able to, as, as Dr. Spivey said, we want to institutionalize it, make it something that doesn't depend on me being here or doesn't depend on Chief Steve Atkins being here, that it will continue on and on long after we're gone. And that, to me, that's where our future lies, is getting the younger people involved getting them interested in particular and getting them prepared. It's, it's one thing to know how things work, but you also need to prepare yourself. And that sometimes means getting an education and getting experience or whatever it may take to position yourself to be in these uh, positions of leadership and authority. Thank you. Chief Ann, anything to add to that? Well, um, I agree with all the things that you said. and. Um, <coughs> As a part, I guess we've been doing this for a while now as a part of our uh, cultural recovery program. Um, a few years ago, we launched something called the Return to the River. We um, were sitting in the tribal center one day talking about when we were kids and um, talking about how during this fishing season, the men would gather and go to the river. And our kids were just sitting there looking at us like, Really? And why did they go together like that? <laughs> and uh, we realized that they didn't know anything about the culture of the river because it was two generations removed. And we had to do something to capture that and to immerse them in those experiences uh, before it got too late. And so we developed something called the Return to the River um, program. And it's, um, we had to figure out a way to get kids to spend time doing something that they could actually learn from. And we decided putting them in the river would be the easiest way to get everybody involved and want to learn things that they, you know, our parents taught us and we didn't even know we were learning. But they had a lot of wisdom on how to teach us. And so things have changed so much now, we had to really look at a new strategy for capturing the attention of children long enough to teach them something. So to have them experience these things on the river uh, became something that the kids are really excited about. Uh, this is our second year, and um, our winter session is about to begin in January, uh, where we'll have you know the, the crafts, the basket weaving, and the pottery making, and all of that for them. Uh, but you couldn't get them to that class. We tried that before, that didn't work. But when we said everybody's gonna go to the river, Everybody wanted to go, and they were learning things from science uh, to the salination of the, of the river and where it was, where it ends, where it begun, where the tides were, how that uh, connected to the tradition of our tribe uh, with the celestial alignments. They didn't know any of that, and so now they're so excited about it, they can come to the winter session and then learn those things. So uh, it's a new strategy you know, that we've had to really look at things to develop um, how these kids are going to become our next leaders because 
You know, I'm, all of our tribal council members are in their 60s, and some are older. So if you don't capture kids now um, and get them immersed in this, then where is going to be the leadership of your tribe? And so that has been a, a challenge for me with everything else that I have on my plate, but it's been one of the greatest joys of uh, my work. And then to be able to set up a, a youth council um, to train the youth how to run meetings, Robert's Rules of Order, uh, to keep them abreast on politically what's going on, uh, to discuss with them issues that we're facing right now on our tribal council without names or any information, just throwing those issues out there and making them grapple with them, and more importantly, observing and seeing how they would grapple with them versus how we are. Um, is really, you know, at, when I was a young kid and I wanted to learn how to swim, there was no one to teach you how to swim, and I kept crying, I want to learn how to swim, I want to learn how to swim, so they threw me out in the middle of the river and I learned how to swim. <laughs> and so it's kind of like the same thing with the kids. You know, you, you throw them out in the middle of all of this um, decisions that have to be made and to look down the road at the seven generations of people that come behind them. It makes them think about the future of the tribe themselves and instills in them the importance of the work that they may do one day. Mm -hmm. One of the hopes that I have is um, that our tribes can work together to 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 develop programs um, that we that we all can engage in and benefit from because while we're different in many ways we're also so much alike and you know there was a, a time in, in our history where we banded together in many ways um, it was for unfortunate reasons again survival um, but we are relatively small tribal communities, and I feel like coming together is going to be a way uh, for us to be able to to think about the next generation and ensure that the next generation um, has some of the experiences you know that we've had growing up in our communities. Well, a little while ago, I was talking to Sam Bearclaw, who's one of our filmmakers. And I said, you know, Native people in our tradition, we are supposed to be able to talk until we get tired and run out of things to say. <laughs> but I think we're supposed to stop at this point and <laughs> take some questions from the audience. So. I have, I have a question and a comment. Now this is Chief Steve Atkins, right. so thank you for being with us. I just want, I want to thank you for being here and the sad truth is, is uh, panelists like this, entities like the Virginia Museum of uh, History and Culture, Virginia Humanities, Jamestown Yorktown Foundation, they are the vehicles, vehicles through which our story is told. Because the Virginia Department of Education, for whatever reason, hasn't stepped up to the plate. They have chosen not to include the truth about who we are. People said truth is stranger than fiction. <laughs> and it is. But you hear the glamorized story of Columbus, and folks know the real story. <coughs> they know the villainous things he did, but it, it's not taught. We know that Lord Delaware ordered the annihilation of the Paspahay tribe in 1610, a scant three and a half years after the settlers landed, May the 14th, 1607. We know about the massacre at Sand Creek in 1864 by a Methodist minister. But those stories aren't told in the history books. So I just want to thank you for taking the time to share the very important details of our history that you share tonight. And again, a shout out to uh, Jamie Boskett, Andrew Talkoff, and the people here at the, at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture who have the nerve to stand up and help us tell our story. Thank you. about chiefs, I want to acknowledge one other chief who's in the audience, and that's Chief Charles Bullock from the Potomac. He's there in the back. Thank you for being here. A question of prayer. Look into your crystal ball. Had the English had not come in 1607, 400 years later, 
What do you think the Indian situation would be today? You could still drink water out of the James River. <laughs> That was one of the things I was thinking about when the English came. One of the statements that they said was that the Indian people were living on the land just like animals. They weren't exploiting the natural resources. And if you look what happens when you exploit the resources, as we've done in the last 400 years, and, uh, they were saying that uh, we weren't really taking care of the land. But look what's happened in 400 years. And, in previous thousands of years before that, right, um, the environment was clean, the waters were clean, we were thriving in, in just the 400 years. Look how, how things have changed for the worse. And so mm -hmm. and hopefully we can, I think enough people know about the bad part of that, we're in a position to change a lot of that and mm -hmm. make it much better. Along, <laughs> along those same lines, so in, in thinking about the, the effect on the environment, it makes me think of balance, right? Everything is about balance um, when it comes to the environment, when it comes to our societies and how we organize ourselves. I feel like things would be very different in terms of how folks from different cultures would be viewed. I don't, we wouldn't have the concept of the socially con constructed concept of race that divides so many of our people. That is a, that is a thing that came out of European colonial expansion. Um, we wouldn't have some of the gender issues that we're dealing with today, especially when it comes to, especially the treatment of indigenous women in this country and the crisis that we're facing, many reservation communities are facing when it comes to the murdering and disappearing of indigenous women. Um, because we, we lived in balance across multiple different levels within uh, community, society, and the environment. So that's something we need to think about, too. A question in the front. In my 70s, I've been through a lot of TV with uh, portraying Indians from Tonto in, uh, to Cochise to F Troop, which did not even cast indigenous people. Um, my husband and I watched something on PBS about the warrior. And the Native Americans have the greatest percentage by far of any ethnic or whatever people volunteering to fight in World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, even modern day. And it shocked me. And they went into the, this program, went into the detail. It, it across the board almost, it's our land. We're fighting for our land. We don't fight for the United States. It's in our blood. We fight for our land. And we have been to some ceremonies. My husband has been, as a veteran, has been uh, given the bits of tobacco in the circle, you know, as a welcome home. And it talks about how they take care of their veterans with PS, PTSD. And I just thought if, if any of you know of any of that or can comment on that, I just think it's something that needs to be publicized more, how brave these, it's the warrior fighting tr tradition and fighting for their lands. One of the things that I, I'd like, and you, you've seen some of my conversations that I've had publicly that I am personally interested in is for the Virginia Indian experience and uh, the United States wars. Because just like on the national level, our people have volunteered or been a part of Civil the Civil War, the Revolutionary, every war uh, the United States has, has fought in, and the, the ones before that uh, with the English. Um, our people have been a, a part of that. Um, one of the interesting examples that I always look to is World War I. Okay, at that time, uh, Indians were not considered citizens of the United States. Um, official citizenship was not granted until 1924. And um, a lot of people don't realize that. And so at the time in 1917 here in Virginia, uh, the draft was out for, to, to get soldiers to fight uh, across the Atlantic Ocean. And that included our people. The government was trying to draft our people, but wait a second, we're not, 
we're not citizens. How can we draft non-citizens? We're Indian people. So we actually had to fight to get recognized as Indian people in World War I to be recognized as non-citizens to say that we couldn't be drafted. And we were successful in that. But as soon as we got that successful ruling, we went and enlisted. So that's a good example of the perceptions and our perspective of how we, we view fighting for our homeland and our, and our country as well. My grandfather was in World War I and uh, he volunteered, of course, and, and his discharge pay, papers, his statement was something like he was proud to be able to fight for this country and he would do it all over again because similar to what you just said, even though we didn't control the land, still don't control it, we don't control what happens here, it's still the land that we're connected to, regardless of how many generations have come and gone. It, it's the land that we're connected to, it's the waters, the rivers, all of our tribes were located on rivers and very much a part of who we are and where we came from. And so I think that is the common sentiment that even though we don't control the land, it's still the land that we came from. And so people are willing to fight for it. I think even this evening, one of the, a couple of the native veterans from Virginia are doing a presentation at the War Memorial tonight, mm -hmm. talking about native um, warriors uh, fighting for the United States in various wars. Wayne, would you cite how your grandfather concluded that narrative, even though I'm not a citizen? Right, <laughs> basically he said the same, even though I'm not a citizen, you know, I, would, I enlisted and I would do it again, just because if he wanted to help fight for this country and for the land. And it's something like 20, over 20%. It is, it's a high percentage, right? Mm -hmm. and, and as warrior societies, the warriors in our tribes are really highly honored. Um, and they, it's like a spiritually an umbilical cord that connects us to this land. Um, and we will fight for it at all costs. And so with that mentality, or with that DNA and that way of thinking, it was, uh, it's no shock that 20% are uh, in, in volunteering for the military. And they're de highly decorated uh, also. They've gotten Purple Hearts and all these, these warriors that have gone in that are Native American. Nobody hears anything about it, but um, it is a fact. Even going back to the French and Indian War, we have documents of Nottoway men fighting with George, for, for the French, with the French and Indian War under George Washington. And he said, I cannot pay you now, but I will. And he does eventually. And he tells how much gold, how many gold coins he gives the, the warriors that fought for the French in the, in the French and Indian War. That's the early 1700s. I'm sorry, go ahead. And I think for many of us, uh, if you remember um, Vietnam and soldiers coming back from Vietnam and being spit on and mistreated, that was something I couldn't understand. I didn't necessarily agree with what was going on Vietnam, in Vietnam, but we treated our, our returning veterans with honor because they had put their life on the line. Most of them, or many of them, were drafted and maybe didn't have much of a choice, but the fact that they did what their country asked them to do, I mean, it was all we could do to honor them when they came back and just could not understand how other <coughs> communities mistreated the veterans the way they did. I was just going to um, recognize the, the code talkers um, in, in World War II and how um, we would not have won that war without the language that those tribes were beaten if they would speak that language. They tried to eradicate the language out of the people and it was the one thing that happened that saved the United States. And so I think Native people have stepped up to the plate over time in many situations that have actually saved the United States. Uh, but you don't know anything about it, but it, it did happen. Well, let's all thank uh, Chief Alston and Chief Richardson. <laughs>
thank, thank you all again. I, I have to say that I've seen the film you're about to see uh, once before, um, but I think that having had this discussion, it offers to me a very different and new lens to, to experience this film through. Um, so unfortunately, the director of the film, uh, Neil Diamond, was unable to be here with us this evening. Um, but I would like to introduce the film um, and then allow you to, uh, to have what I hope is an eye-opening experience about the portrayal of Native people in Hollywood. So the film was released in 2010. Real Injun is, as I said, the work of Canadian Cree filmmaker Neil Diamond, who looks at the Hollywood Indian, quote unquote, exploring the portrayal of North American natives through a century of cinema. Traveling through the heartland of America and into the Canadian North, Diamond looks at how the myth of, quote unquote, the Indian has influenced the world's understanding and misunderstanding of native people and traces the evolu evolution of cinema's depiction of native people from the silent film era to today. It was described by one reviewer as a loving look at cinema through the eyes of the people who appeared in its very first flickering images and have survived to tell their stories uh, their own way. So thank you all again for joining us this evening. I hope you find, as I said, Real Engine to be uh, inspiring in some ways, eye-opening in others, um, just as I did when I first saw it. And if you're interested, I'll give another plug to, uh, for Brad, but if you are interested in more stories like the one you're about to see, I'd encourage you all, if you haven't already, to purchase your tickets to see more films by and about Native people during the Pocahontas Reframed Storytellers Film Festival. So enjoy the film. <laughs> 